<laughs> okay, hey, welcome to American Vindicta. Um, you missed a, about 20 minutes of an awesome conversation. We're going to try and repeat. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we have Jamie Walden on with us. Jamie, it's been a while since you've been on, bro. So thanks for coming back on. And let's, yeah, continue, man. With, let's continue with this super weird conversation. By the way, thanks for complimenting me on my hair. I um, know. I'm jealous. I'm um, like, dang, Doug, I need some of those Viking genetics so I can grow out a man bun because I'm basically going to have a horseshoe. I said I'm going to look like the dude from the Princess Bride in about two years. So, <laughs> yeah, but for the listeners, this happens every time as Doug and I go, hey, what's up, bro? Hey, what's up, bro? Bro, bro, bro. Right. We, and then like I'm like, just brute, just stop. Just hit record because we end up talking for an hour and a half before we hit record. And anyways, I'm like, just hit record. So. There's no lead in. We literally just hit record right now. Here we go. Yeah, yeah we do this every time. All right. Let, yeah. Let's let's go back to the original conversation. The original conversation. All right. So I don't want to share the picture because me and someone else um, are going to be doing an investigation here in um, here in America um, over Bigfoot. Now it sounds kind of silly. Um, I actually do believe Bigfoot's real. I have no idea what it is, uh, but I do believe people are seeing something being harassed by something. I do believe that there is a way to scientifically evaluate these experiences, and then from there, step forward as a Christian, go and call out whatever it is and demand it expose itself, and then from there, rid it of that area. That's what we're supposed to be doing. That's what I'm going to be doing. Um, so this investigation is kind of it's kind of unique, Jamie. So um, this guy, he has been harassed for a period of time by a Bigfoot, either one, two, maybe even three. We're not sure how many, but for we're for sure there's two because there's two different footprint sizes. One of the footprint sizes, I'll send you the picture. Looks like the tread of a car. I mean, it's like that wide, about that tall. It looks like it's 18 inches long, at least. At least eight or nine inches wide. Um, clear definition, heel print, side of the foot, inside of the foot, toes. Now, I'm I'm a I'm a snob when it comes to evidence, and I know how many people fake stuff. And I get that and I understand that. So I always want to put things to the scientific method as much as possible. But this guy has like dial up internet. He's in his mid sixties. He lives way out in the mountains. He doesn't have social media. And the only way we know about this is that a friend of his, and I'm not going to disclose anything else about that, but a friend of his um, contacted one of the other guys doing the investigation and told him the the series of experiences that we're about to uncover. And so that it, it was at some point frightening enough that it needed to be reported. So let's get straight into this. Here's one of them. One of them is that he's sleeping one night, him and his wife sleeping in bed. And I guess it's like a bad storm's going on. And on his back porch, he has a tarp that's covering material and one edge of the tarp is just whipping in the wind and it's keeping him up at night. And he tells his wife, you know, remind me in the morning, I need to go and put a, a cinder block on that tarp. So when he gets up that morning, there's a cinder block on that tarp. You know, as far as I I'm trying to gather this, I asked his wife, did you do that? Um, as far as we know, the answer is no. So, Tells his wife, hey, you know, we need a cinder block on this tarp, wakes up, and there's a cinder block. Another one of the strange encounters, all right, and that may not seem too strange to some people. Maybe he just did it and he just forgot. Um, but there's a there's a, a next series of events here that is interesting. One of the next series of events is that he's at home. I believe he's alone when this happens. 
And he said that it was at night and he could hear a Bigfoot roaring in the distance that was so loud that it actually shook the inside of his house and it terrified him. Now, I've heard that account multiple times listening to other Bigfoot reports. Um, yeah, that's a very that's a very common experience with uh, that type of paranormal reality with Bigfoot. Yeah. Uh, once again, trying to explain what this is, is just beyond me. All I can all I can do is repeat what the eyewitness testimony is, which me and you were cops at one point. Honestly, when it comes to trying to prove stuff, I'm not trying to prove anything. I'll give the evidence and let the jury decide. Um, from there, here's another event. He's at home. I believe he's alone again. And he hears a voice come into his head. Now, this is another thing um, that is very frequent with these Bigfoot encounters, extremely low frequency, also known as voice to school technology, where you hear someone talking inside your head. Um, and this voice tells him to come outside. And he kind of snaps to and complies with the voice. And as he's walking outside, something in his body, something in his, his spirit, I guess, makes him want to grab his rifle or shotgun. It's a gun that's near the, the back door, I believe. So he goes to reach for it, and then he hears this voice again, and it says, you won't need that. And again, he complies. And he walks out the door, and he says, off the, the back side of the porch is about a 12-foot tall, four to five foot wide, uh, salt and peppered Bigfoot. And it says to him again in his head, I just wanted to see what you looked like. And then it just meanders off into the woods. Now me, when <laughs> our buddy uh, was telling me about this, he was relaying to me the eyewitness testimony. Um, I am highly speculative of people's encounters. I don't typically trust what people say because I know a lot of people want five minutes of internet fame, but this guy, he, he, he's just an old retiree. He's got like dial up internet. Um, he doesn't have social media. He, I don't think he rarely even uses the internet where he's at and he lives way out in the mountains, you know? And so not having footprint on social media, not having his own YouTube page or anything like that for internet stardom and just reporting what he, what experiences has happened to him, to his friend who reported it to us. I thought that gave it a little bit more uh, validation because this guy's not seeking for one thing. He's not seeking for us to come there and do an investigation. We had to reach out to him. And the person who did the reporting is a pastor. Now, this guy's friend where these weird experiences are happening. He and his sons have also seen the Bigfoot. They said they clearly saw it from a certain distance. Um, it lasted for more than 10 or 15 seconds. They sat there and they looked eye to eye at this thing. They said it was gigantic. And that he's seen it on multiple occasions over the past however many years of being in this area and knowing uh, what we would call, I guess, the uh, the victim. Um, one of the other things that was strange was they killed a, 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 a black bear hunting season, killed a black bear, harvested it. And they took the fat of the black bear and set it outside. And they were going to come back and get it the next day. And then the fat was all gone. And there were big, greasy handprints on the sides of a tree and huge footprints. And I'll send you the pictures of it. And you can see that the stride of the footprints are at least, and I mean at least, five to six feet apart from each other. Yeah, that's a, huge. Yeah, that's a big one. Um, mm -hmm. whatever, it, whatever it is, that's a big one. Um, and so it appears. It would appear in some ways that it was there's been harassment um, by this creature to this victim. We've heard of many encounters like this in the tales 
of Bigfoot where they'll throw stones at you. You can have a whole family of them uh, converge down on you. Uh, we've had that story that was in a, at a hunting lodge in, I think, Northern California, uh, where the Bigfoot attacked a group of hunters. Um, these, these encounters are not rare, but the evidence is rare. And the only evidence that you almost ever get is a, a footprint. And you get one, maybe one or two, but this one, we have many footprints around this area and we also have handprints so i don't think the handprints once again this is also coming from an old photo uh none of the handprints are good enough to get any type of prints off of fingerprints or anything like that or even do any type of dna connection uh collection but we'll look while we're there but that's that's a uh, part of what we're getting ourselves into here pretty soon um mm -hmm. we're we're going to be using FLIRs. Uh, thermal imaging, we're going to be using night vision, uh, drones, and we're going to combat it as like an actual investigation and not some hokey thing where people are wanting to smack on trees and, you know, try to get Bigfoot out there to hug it or whatever. <clears throat> uh, that's not the way we'll approach this. So, yeah, well, and I, I can tell Bigfoot. you, Doug, in, in my area, you know, uh, uh, some of the listeners may be familiar with where with where I'm at, but I can actually look out. I'm in my office. Um, I can look out this window and look at Mesa Verde National Park. Doug's been out here with his family before. So I'm literally right in the shadow of Mesa Verde National Park, which is the Mancus Valley of Mancus, Colorado. So it's like Dolores, Mancus, Cortez, just outside of Durango. And what's interesting is even in Tom Horn's book, um, unearthing the cloud eaters and several other ones, the late Tom Horn, he has several particular mentions to the Mancus Valley throughout all the uh, First Nations people and the North American uh, Native North American tribes throughout the region where Mancus, which is where I, my address is a Mancus address, is particularly a hotbed for all things enigmatic, what we'll call high strangeness, right? Anything from the skinwalkers to the portals to the spirals in the sky to uh, the giants Nephilimic stuff to the hybridization. That's all the Kachina doll stuff and all the other things that we see in our reality all around here still. Um, it's where the Anasazi, Pueblo, Navajo, Ute type tribes were all in this region that were building in the cliffs. So all these quick cliff dwellers all the way down in the Chaco Canyon. I'm not too far from Dulce, New Mexico. I'm not too far from Los Alamos. New Mexico. I'm not too far from Pagosa Springs, Colorado, and the UFO Superhighway, which runs down here in uh, southwestern Colorado, kind of over by the Salida-ish area over here in Colorado, is this is the hotbed. So I have friends that are Navajo and, and they're believers, and 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 uh, I've talked to a lot of different Navajo, and, and, uh, and they all openly talk about the recurrent interaction with what they would describe i'm i'm paraphrasing their language as interdimensional creatures what we would historically either call skinwalkers or also bigfoot slash sasquatch right uh right now concurrently especially in the di different native american groups they can use some of those languages interchangeably but this area is a hotbed i have primary source information pagosa springs which by the way has the deepest uh, hot water thermal vent in the world is in uh, Pagosa Springs, Colorado. It's right next to us. And uh, on a whitewater rafting trip, uh, my buddy was talking to the guide and he was just a bro. Like you think of a classic whitewater rafting guide during tour tourist season. He's just a super bro and he's blah, blah, blah about this range and that range and this range and that range. I have people that come to my church that live in Pagosa Springs. Right. And they were, uh, and they do all their backcountry work in Pagosa Springs, but they, they, this guide said, off the cuff, didn't know, didn't know anybody in the group, right? He's just a guy, didn't know my buddy, didn't know anything. He was on his way to my house and he stopped there to Whitewater Raft real quick. And the guy goes, oh, and by the way, bro, right? He's a super bro. Like, by the way, bro, nobody goes into that range over there. Like, that range is off limits. And my buddy's like, why? What's up with that range? He goes, well, when you get back in there deep enough, you're going to bump into a group of people in full tactical gear who told me when I bumped into them, I couldn't go any further because they are tasked with guarding the secrets of this mountain range 
and that they are of a particular bloodline and their tasking is to guard the secrets of what lives in this mountain range back here and it's off limits. That's what he was told. And he was like, what are you talking about? He goes, I don't know. It sounds kind of crazy, but like giants or something like that. That's what this guy told him off the cuff. So anyways, right, paddling around. And the guy's like, this dude has no idea that I actually understand that whole context with, with, with which he's talking. So it's crazy because you fast forward or not fast forward, but drive down the road a little ways to where I'm at here in the Four Corners area. This is where a lot of the ancient aliens, uh, you know, panspermia type documentaries and TV shows, they come out here to film all of our pictographs and our hieroglyphs. All right. Like I live, what am I, four miles from Canyon of the Ancients right here from the Canyon of the Ancients, where you have all these panoramas of all these aliens and spacecraft and blah, blah, blah. The things that you always see, those frescoes and all these videos trying to uh, trying to talk about the ancient alien narrative. But this area is a hotbed for all that type of activity, so much so that on our camp, uh, there's particular areas where my boys who are young, uh, one of them not even a teenager yet, they will not go in camp because of what they experienced one night when eyes about 12 feet off the ground were taunting them in the middle of the night within, I mean, I can almost within 150 yards of my house. And they will not go in those woods ever again because of what they experienced back in there. So all that to say is we don't know what's going on. Uh, but obviously there is a degree of understanding about these things uh, that the elite know, that all occultists know and understand, that the authentic uh, integrity-based historians and archaeologists know and understand. And uh, and I think it's a thing, Doug, that you and I are very aware of is about ready. It's on the cusp of breaking out onto the scene all over again. And it the Bible is very clear that men's hearts will fail them for fear of what they see coming upon the earth or up on the earth, right? Like we have a very clear distinction, a definitive understanding biblically that there are going to be things breaking out on the scene of high strangeness with which we don't have the paradigm capacity or the comfort slash normalcy bias to be able to ad adequately process. And it's going to be a shock factor beyond comprehension. Well, what do you what do you make of this, these stories from the natives? Um, I mean, it, it is rooted within almost every tribe that I know or am aware of. Um, it's rooted in almost every one of their their oral histories of interactions with little people, reptilians, flying things, giants, bigfoots, skinwalkers, wendigos, and and to to have a thousand plus year oral history. And the natives will tell you that you know they're thousand thousands of years old, but to have a thousand plus years or more of this oral history. Which is a reflection upon many various different societies around the world where everyone's really kind of saying the same thing. Everyone's seeing the they same are. thing. Yeah. They just describe it differently. Um, it, isn't it amazing the mainline Christian does not believe any of this? Like, do you not understand you live in a supernatural world with supernatural creatures? You yourself or a spirit being when we're encased in flesh, but you yourself are spirit. How do you, I don't understand. Like when you try to bridge the gap between the common person who just shows up at church on Sunday, they barely even read their Bible. They're, they're about this much Christian. The lack of faith that's in a lot of Christians. It's to me, it's worrisome because when you see these things coming, you don't know what they are. And the only people to tell you what they are is going to be the correct pastor who knows what he's talking about and who's brave and he stands up for his for his God and for his people and tells them what they are. And then the scientist who will tell you what they are, the scientist, the Hindu, the blah, 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 all the new age uh, people who worship little G gods. And by the way, the, the Christians are greatly outnumbered compared to everybody else. Greatly yeah. outnumbered. It is crazy, bro, because in all reality, it is the believers who have a biblical worldview 
that should be holding out the answers to all these things because every detail of it's in the Bible. I don't care if it's hybridization. I don't care if it's pre-flood antediluvian superstructures and high advanced technology. I don't care if it's uh, little creatures or big creatures. It speak, the Bible speaks openly about satyrs, right? It talks openly about Leviathan and behemoth and, and giants and hybridization and the lion-faced men and King Og of Bashan, right? And obviously Goliath and his brothers and the and the the Anakim and the Ananaki, not the Anunnaki, but the Anakim and all these different uh, Phoenician and pre-Canaanitic tribes and what they were doing and how they were doing it. We have depictions of stargates and portals opening and closing of of uh, what we what the New Agers want to tap into as astral projection. Right? They, it's all a perversion of what God's already instituted in the scriptures. We have. All kinds of stories from Paul to Philip to Elijah to Elijah to Ezekiel being caught up, right? And then they're transliterated to another place. We it's we have all the answers. We have all the answers to what's going on in the ether and blah, blah, blah. All these different things, even celestial events with the shattering of the planet Rahab and things that are going on up there. And though you set your nest among the stars, I'm going to bring you low, right? Obadiah 4. Uh, we have the depictions of what uh, ufologists would often want to claim is high advanced technology from authors, extraterrestrial, you know, super civilizations. Yet I believe that there is a high probability that there are actually living creatures that people are dis that people are under the delusion is a craft because we have the wheel within a wheel with the circles and the eyes and blah, blah, blah. And all these celestial things, read the book of Ezekiel that are in the heavenly realms from seraphim, the cherubim to these guys and these guys and these entities, lots of high strangeness, high, high strangeness. And it's in all the pictographs. It's in all the hieroglyphs. It's in all the geoglyphs around the face of the earth, the same exact depictions of the same exact entities of the same exact quote unquote craft, which I think they're actually living beings, because because, again, we have to remember that a third of them fell. A third of them are insurrection or insurrectionary and in open rebellion. A third of those things that we have depictions of all throughout scripture and now through de delusions and deceptions and confusions and manipulations of, of the human consciousness, they're able to uh, lead us into what will be the great deception. And that's why it, it is weird that Christians don't address these things. If there's anybody that should be tapping into stuff, it should be the Christians. I'm always like, you know, everybody's like good vibes, bro. Good vibes. And they got all their crystals and they got all their whatever. And they're talking about the energies of this and the auras of that ball. And I go, yeah, absolutely, man. I always say, I love talking to new agers and occultists. I'm like, yeah, man, like you're, you, you're locking onto something, but guess what? The energies that you're perceiving and that you're in tune to is actually a gift from the Lord. It's a gift of discernment. And those energies that you're uh, in tune to and that you're trying to tap into, they're actually in harmonic resonance through the Schumann's resonance of the entirety of the earth. And they're actually all worshiping my God. The rocks cry out, the trees stand and clap their hands. There is a harmonic resonance that is singing to my God at all times. So you are dead right, but you are being deceived into worshiping and serving the creation rather than the creator who put those energies and those things you're tapping into. You know, so it's like, we should have, and, and and I've literally had new agers commit their life to Christ and repent on the spot, throw away all their Buddhism, throw away all their Shintoism, throw away all their new age garbage because they've never heard somebody connected. When you start talking about the Kundalini spirit and what they're doing through the yoga and what they're doing with their shaka, shakra and what they're doing, blah, blah, blah. Their high strangeness that they've experienced that they don't have answers for, whether it's sleep paralysis or abduction phenomenon or ufology or whatever weird stuff, nobody's giving them the answers. So then the powers of darkness use it to bait them into greater deception and to keep them that much farther from the Lord. The Bible believing believers with a hardcore dogmatic biblical worldview should be holding out the answers to all of these things, all these things at all times. You know, what one thing that's an interesting connection between like demonic forces and Bigfoot, all right? Some say they're they're interchangeable. Some says we're, we're talking about the exact same thing. It's a demon. Bigfoot is a demon. Or Bigfoot's a Raphaim. It's it's a hybrid of of the fallen angel and the woman 
whatever it is, I think it's interesting that within the presence of Bigfoot, like within the presence of demons, and I've been in the presence of demons, where there is this aura of fear that it's fear. like you, I was just you, gonna say fear. You yep. walk into a field like a, you ever walk near like a, a high electrical pole or something. You can feel the ecstatic electricity. You can feel the fear by these yeah. things. And it's interesting. I've been a victim of sleep paralysis many times uh, before I was ever saved. And at least on two occasions, I can remember. And there are so many people who have the same account where I'm looking into my doorway and I see this gigantic four to five foot wide, over seven foot tall black mass. And it, it's emitting the sphere. All right. And then you have Bigfoot, this gigantic four to five foot tall or four to five foot wide, seven plus foot tall creature emitting fear. And then you have the giants. Probably the same size. Let's go ahead and say it three to four to five feet wide, seven plus feet tall. It's interesting when you talk about the paranormal research and you talk about the kind of people who do that kind of research and just how few are actually Christian and actually understand what they're dealing with and wanting to talk to. Um, I've, I've watched many shows of, of ghost chasers, ghost hunters, and they're wanting to talk to these entities. I'm like, you have no idea what you're doing, bro. So like, such folly. Yeah, such why? folly. It's like all these guys at Skinwalker, you know. I'm like, and then they're coming home with uh the paranormal, they're they're coming the home with things they didn't want inside their house, you know. It's like you you it, it's one of those things where I you never mock. I mean, even the book of Jude speaks to this, how they slander celestial beings that they don't understand, like unreasoning animals, like you, I, you don't ever want to mock or taunt or whatever the powers of darkness. They are powers of darkness. They have extreme power. However, in Christ Jesus, the blood of Christ, the supremacy and the dominion of Christ over all things, it says all ruler, rulers and authorities, things visible and invisible, all authority over all things. Speaking of Christ Jesus, his power is still yet greater. So it's like, we don't go at those things with a uh, hubris, you know, like a haughtiness or an arrogancy, but uh, knowing and understanding being covered in Christ Jesus and his righteousness and ho his holiness and his power and allowing him to sanctify and consecrate our lives, remove any sin issues so that we can stand and withstand on the day of great evil against these things, because it is no joke. I've had sleep paralysis like you wouldn't believe. I've had my bed levitated in the middle of the night and dropped. Uh, most of your listeners are probably familiar with the highest level that I've experienced with uh, I, I won't say the word out loud because I don't want people to go research it, but a very particular high level thing that came through through my phone and stopped my heart, knocked me off my feet. People saw it. Uh, and this isn't sensational, like high level stuff. Light bulbs explode over my head. You know, when I'm walking down the street, um, uh, uh, witches coven astral project into my rooms in the middle of the night twice. I've had that and uh, mocking me and scoffing me and taunting me right at the foot of my bed and and like high level stuff. I know you you and your wife. I won't even say her name on, on the air. I don't want anybody knowing my family's reality on the air either. But like, I know what you guys have encountered. You and I talk about it regularly, consistently. Uh, high strangeness, right, going on. But it's only in the authority and the covering in the name of Jesus Christ that we can stand and withstand. And that's why people go, "Why well, this doesn't have any relevance. Why would Doug and Jamie even talk about it? This is soft topic. They should be talking about current events or preaching the word. And it's like, no, it may not have relevance to you. But to the person that has no answers and they've been tormented and plagued their whole life, they have abandoned the faith because they don't think God's real. Because if God's real, why would this evil exist? To the people that are having UFO, ufology or abduction-based experiences, to the people that don't have unexplained answers, it is relevant to them. And I can assure you of this, it's going to become increasingly relevant even to the normie Normans of the world that haven't had to, by God's grace, experience this supernatural kind of world. That's a mercy of God that you haven't had to, had to see that thinning of the veil around you. But I assure you of this, you are going to, 
I'm certain of it because the scripture tells us about the angel giving the key to the bottomless pit and what's loosed out of that bottomless pit and the king over him, you know, Apollyon or Apollos, the destroyer, right? And what comes out? I can assure you it talks about the torment that they have the power to torment, but not to kill. I can assure you it talks about men looking after these things coming onto the earth and their hearts physiologically, physiologically, we're not talking about an emotional failing, physiologically failing them to the death for fear of what they see coming onto the earth. We know as it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Lot, so shall be the coming of the Son of Man. This stuff is getting ready to break back open. And Doug, if you want, we can even start tying that in to the, to the occult. Every, everywhere starting from the onset of theosophy in the late 1800s and what that broke out through even the flapper movement, right? And all that that era of the 1920s, which led into the rise of Nazi Germany and communist Bolshevik-based Russia at the exact same time, all the way through Operation High Jump and Operation Paperclip and blah, 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 to get us to the point now, including nuclear weapons, nuclear weapons testing, and high strange phenomenon over all nuclear weapon sites by supernatural, quote unquote, craft, you blah, blah, blah. It's all interconnected and it's happening in real time while most people are unaware of it. Before we open up that Pandora's box of... of <laughs> yeah, where do you start on that, man? <laughs> I want to say, I'll, I'll tell you where it starts. You go all the way back to the garden. It starts at the garden. When Satan told Adam and Eve that they could be as God or they could be gods, depending on your translation, mankind has seeked after the means and availability to up, uplift themselves to be a god. Um, many emperors, dynastical emperors, many kings, many Caesars, uh, you name it, tribal leaders, they all envision themselves or would call themselves a god uh, inhabiting a human form, which we would say is a demon inhabiting a human. Um, and so that has reached all the way from the garden to now. And that the, there's always, bro, there's even, always even to the to the fact that we call our nation's center a capital. Most people don't understand that. That is very unique that we call Washington, D.C. Hello, District of Columbia. Do your research. A capital goes back even to what Doug is saying about this uh, this attainment or apotheosis or apotheosizing of uh, the the incessant pursuit of godhood the fact that our nation is called a capital listeners do your research look up why it is called a capital there's very few places on the face of the earth that call their nation center a capital of course we chose to do that in the district of columbia so it's all right in plain sight people just don't understand it yeah built by the brotherhood of the masons Yep, yeah, with the apotheos, with the uh, apotheosis of uh, Washington and the frescoes on the top, surrounded by the Sybil Kumain, Sybil uh, occultic demigods of old. It's like it's so plain. The only pursuit of the fallen human nature is this attainment of God likeness, so that they can make war against God Himself. Isn't it? Isn't it weird? As a patriot and as a veteran, to finally know that and to look back and go, what did I serve? <laughs> no kidding, man. Doesn't it bother yeah. you every now and then? Like, well, we Marines, we serve for we Marines. But in the background, what did we go and do and who and what for? And who was the powers backing them that pushed exactly. us into our wars it uh it's upsetting once again it's why i will never ever fight for um this government you'll always fight for your people but i'll never fight in the name of this government and i'll never ask people to do either um but jane you know what's crazy bro for me one of the most ex upsetting iconographies ever is the statue of liberty and the washington monument Oh, those Pauline. two things which are which are our national iconography that are in everything are the most disgusting, in-your-face, Luciferian objects of open affront rebellion against a holy God on the face of the earth. There is nothing like them 
anywhere else on the earth still standing that God didn't well, already ex- obliterate and totally destroy. Explain, because people don't understand who built the Statue of Liberty and who the Statue of Liberty is. It's not a woman. No, the Statue of Liberty is not a woman. It's unequivocally a man. And it actually goes back to pre-flood Phoenician slash Canaanitic uh, high-level occultic practices of mystery school, mystery religion. It's Isis, Ishtar, Semiramis, Inanna. Uh, one of the best researchers at this is uh, Derek Gilbert, um, uh, formerly of Skywatch TV. He's written numerous oh, books on the etymology of these different gods and goddesses and how they're rooted and how they're listed all throughout scripture. Uh, it is Lucifer himself. It is actually a depiction of Lucifer from ancient occultism. You can you can do a quick Google image search of Ishtar, Inanna, Astarte, and all these different things. And they have these feminine and masculine qualities, which is why this rise of transgenderism is so important. It's occultic. It has nothing to do with sexual perversity. It has nothing to do with sexual perversity. It goes back to these attributes of the golden age of the gods and what they represented it. And so what you see in this depiction of the Statue of Liberty, which is actually Columbia, holding as a light bearer, the bearer of light, Lucifer, claiming the land for himself, right smack at the key of everything, to unto the district of Columbia, Columbia, Isis, Ishtar, Inanna, you know, blah, blah, Astarte, with the Washington Monument, looking at the womb of Semiramis, Isis, Ishtarte, blah, 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 Inanna, and the phallic symbol of Nimrod, presupposing that one day, which is the largest, the largest uh, obelisk on the face of the earth, Egyptological ancient, ancient occultic practices that they say at one day is going to emit, follow the language, into the womb, which is the Capitol building, the dome of Inanna to resurrect the ancient God of old, Apollo or Apollyon or Nimrod. It's it's the etymology of the word. And then we see in the scriptures that Apollo or Apollyon, who is Nimrod, is going to come back on the scene physically, literally, not metaphorically, with a key to a bottomless pit to release things up onto the earth, things that are withheld in chains in the earth for the day of judgment, which is all biblical. So I those two iconographies, not to mention the fact that we have an exact replica of the Temple of Pergamon, which was literally the seat of Satan in our nation's capital. It's all in plain sight. And yet people go, what's the big deal? What are you talking about? You know, it's it's well, insane, well, man. Now, all right. Now, since you opened that box, you got to talk about what happens every time we elect a president. The arising of Osiris ceremony. Okay. So, so Doug's, Doug's good at asking questions because we all know this. We, we both know the same stuff. So we can, I've been, I've other. been there for this <laughs> ceremony, not in, in the building. I was protecting the president. We were all yeah. out there protecting the president on pres on president's Avenue way, whatever over there by the Capitol building. While this was going on, this Disgusting. was unbeknownst, unbeknownst to me while I'm out there, you know, gun toting and all that cool stuff. Um, I had no idea that this ceremony happened how, until how could we? a yeah. few years like, after. Right. And so let, let me put this out there be, for the listeners is I, any, I suggest everybody go buy Belly the Beast by Justin and Westfall produced through Skywatch TV. I believe it's still available on Amazon. And also the late Tom Horn, a dear brother, his last documentary that he did. Now I can't remember something like uh, like the future destiny of America. Those two are the most well-researched, documented and produced documentaries on the occultic undertones of everything going on in Washington, D.C. from the founding of our nation ever. It will connect dots to you in a way that you'll go, oh, my goodness, my whole life's a lie. So. I say that to say they're the ones that have pieced together through longitudinal, very adept research on the raising of Osiris ceremony that occurs every single time a president has been inaugurated since 
President George Washington at the Scottish Rite Freemasonry Temple just down from the Capitol building. It is being performed every time there is an empty sarcophagus tomb in the basement of that Scottish Rite Freemasonry Temple where they perform their high-level mission school occultic practices where they believe any day, any time at any inauguration – that the indwelling of Apollos, Apollyon, Osiris, Nimrod is going to resurrect into one of the presidents of the United States and that the United States is will be the resurrected Atlantean super city, the center of the coming Aquarian age and resurrection of a global superstructure as in the days of Nimrod. They fully believe that, and that's why the United States was set out with 13 colonies, and there's 13 feathers on the phoenix. By the way, our national symbol is a phoenix, not an eagle, and there's 13 arrows, and there's 33 stones in the pyramid, and it's unfinished pyramid with the all-seeing eye of Osiris on top of the pyramid, on the back of every one of your talisman, waiting for the day where the pyramid can, or where the all-seeing eye of Osiris connects to the period and the and the work is finished for their novus order seclorum. It's all in plain sight. They 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 don't they don't even they don't even hide it. I mean, the entire Capitol building district is laid out in, in a Molochian iconography of a giant owl. I mean, it's like it's so plain. There's a reason why it's the Pentagon. Like it. Every little detail, they don't skip every street, every name, every title, every edifice, every fresco, every depiction, every painting in Washington, D.C. is this is the place where what we know is as as the Antichrist will arise and rule and reign. They believe it is the place where their messianic figure will usher their them in through the self-directed evolutionary process of humanity to become like gods once and for all time. Okay. Let me, let me say a few things for one. Do you think the antichrist will come from America? Cause I think he'll come from Rome, but doesn't mean he can't be Roman and not be a president. I mean, he could have descent back to that. Um, but two, like, I don't know how many other people have been to DC. Not only is it a disgusting place and it's a extreme, it's disgusting. extreme letdown, but you won't find a statue of Jesus anywhere. Nowhere. No, no, nowhere. I, I mean, it's like you walked back into Athens. It's like if they remade Rome, which is what they modeled it after, that's what you're walking back into. And yeah. so, so many cops that I know that work in that area, the amount of violence, I, I don't think people understand this either. The amount of murder, violence, lying, thievery, prostituteism, um, not just of actual prostitutes, but of our leaders being prostitutes of this country to other countries and foreign powers and things that they're observing and worshiping, not of God. Um, I mean, it is it is the consequential epitome of the sin of the United States. It begins and ends in Washington, D.C. It spreads out of the world, but it begins yeah. and ends there. And I always wondered the same thing you just said with the the raising of Osiris. Who do you think that is going to be there? In my mind, there could be no one else. But the Antichrist, I mean, unless there's a demonic prince that raises up like Persia, where you had a demon over them, but it is so specific. And not only that, Israel and the United States are spiritually connected. We're not connected physically, but right. we are spiritually connected. And Very it only, spiritually connected. It, it only makes sense that this does happen. Um, with the Antichrist, there's a few things that I I I believe with the Antichrist. Some people disagree with me. My wife and I have done our studies on this. I believe the Antichrist will come from the lineage of Jesse David because he's got to fool the Jews. He has to fool the Jews. He has to by their bloodline and all that uh, uh, family history. They're going to look back and see who are you, where'd you come from, where what are your origins, what's your tribe. This is the Messiah. 
Um, it doesn't mean that he has to be from Israel, but it wouldn't surprise me if he was Hebrew by well, birth. And you know what, Doug, that, that interconnectivity is interesting because if you notice that the majority of the American lobby is of uh, Israel. Israeli the Zionist. The biggest lobby. It's, yeah, the biggest, biggest lobby, lobby is is Zionism. And now, now I'm not anti-Jew. I'm not anti-Semitic, but I am anti-political Zionism. That is not biblical. That is not glorify the Lord. That is not honor the Lord. There's nothing related to it. Oh, and by the way, the star of David is the star of Ishtar, Semiramis, Inanna, Isis, flying in your faces. So you have us as the centrality of that uh, mystery Babylon, mystery school, haunt hideout for every foul and unclean spirit, makes the whole world junk with their immorality, traffics in the souls of people. And it says, found the dead of all the, uh, the slain of all the earth through our pharmacia, right? Like all the hammer and all the earth, as it says in Jeremiah 15, 51, what we do, a global police force and do all these things. And yet the highest level of all the cultism of the world is the United States of America. People don't like to hear that because it's they they have rose colored lenses on, and then well, a you lot have of it happens in your churches too. Exactly, and then you have the Zionist Israeli lobby, which is doing the same thing. And if you notice, the root of the Israeli lobby or Zionist lobby in America is not biblical Judaism. It is Talmudic and Kabbalistic in origin. Anytime you see somebody with the red string around their wrist, uh, pay attention to the Kushners, pay attention to Ivanka, pay attention to uh, guys like uh, old Tucker Carlson, all these high level guys, you will always see that red string, which generally not always, right? Some people use it for other things, but uh, generally it is, it is associated with a public proclamation of Kabbalism. Kabbalism is pre-flood Canaanitic mystery school that God kept judging Israel for dabbling in. It never went away. It's never gone away. It went underground, but not really when the fact that the flag over Israel is the highest level symbol of a cultic devotion on the face of the earth is that Israeli flag. There's no such thing as a star of David. Do your research in the mystery schools. It is the star of Ishtar or Semiramis, the feminine aspect of Osiris, Nimrod, Apollo, Apollyon, you know, Zeus, whatever, you name it, is the feminine aspect of it. And even the fact that they portray the feminine aspect is the finger in the eye of God, who's a patriarch. So they want to even go that far as to usurp God by elevating matriarchal worship instead of patriarchal worship of God as a father over all these things. This is the root of feminism. This is the root of free love movement. This is the root of high level LGBTQ and transgenderism is to elevate the feminine aspect through occultic practices as a finger in the eye of God, the true and better patriarch. I I think one thing that's very interesting about Tucker. Now I, I watch Tucker a lot. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm he's, always he, he's funny. I'm always interested yeah. to see what he says. Now look, I am not. I'm going to say something that is upsetting for me to say. I was so confused when God brought this clarity to me about what patriotism meant. Now Tucker. He's very patriotic. Tucker talks yeah. about his religious beliefs. He says that he believes in God. Dude, his show now, with Sean Ryan was excellent. Like, I learned yep. a lot about Tucker on his show with Sean Ryan. Never heard him say Jesus. Yeah. Now, look, as a Christian, you should be almost jumping for joy when you say Jesus. You should be. A, we say it all the time on this show every chance we get. Jesus is Lord. You, you won't hear. I haven't heard Trump say it. I haven't heard Tucker say it. I haven't heard a lot of these people say it, but they all talk about God, but I haven't heard Jesus, the only way to God. So it, it makes me sit back and I just kind of question the conspiratorial part of my, my mind, Jamie, you know how my mind works. And I just wonder, like, are we so sold out into, into patriotism and saving this country? And I'm just as guilty as the next guy for it. Um, you know, having American flags and, and I just sit back and I go, you know, when you really realize what America is, what we stand for now, or what we were 
always, I guess, have stood for. And the lie that we were told about what we Americans actually are while our leaders are, you know, they're they're in the temple and they're secretly worshiping all the fallen gods and having blood sacrifices and all this other stuff, just like what it says in the Old Testament. I believe that's Elijah. Was that Elijah or Ezekiel that was shown that? I think it was Ezekiel. Uh, Ezekiel. Um, yep. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I sit back, man, and I just go like, part of me wants to take down my American flags because I believe we are not what we think we are. And for one thing, I, I'm I'm kingdom of God first. So what's my root identity? And I just, dude, I get, I get tormented by it. I'm like, man, like we are so sold into the lie. Like it, it's, it's interesting when world war three starts, will they get back onto that? You know, patriotism, rah, 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 like nine 11, uh, like Pearl Harbor. Will they, will they go back for that? And how many people are so sold out for patriotism that they'll willfully won't even need that first draft. They'll go straight in. Then how many of us are actually red pilled and by red pilled, how, how far did you swallow that pill? Uh, did you swallow just to right here? So you just believe enough conspiracy theories that you think Alex Jones has told you everything, or do you actually truly now open your spiritual eyes, open your spiritual ears and hear through scripture, through the word of God, what is actually around you, what we're actually into, what we're actually dealing with, the powers, the principalities, the forces of darkness. I mean, when you think about it like that, man, like as Nero was burning down Rome, do you think the centurions were like, man, super glad I'm a patriot? You know, no. Yeah, no. they're going, oh my goodness. And you know what, Doug, just to, I mean, I'm not, I'm not pushing back on what you're saying at all, but just to, to, I guess, add to it is, it is weird, you know, we're told in first Peter one, that we are the elect exiles of the dispersion. And what Peter is addressing is actually when God willingly took those who honored him, those who were faithful to God, he actually took an exile into Babylon into Babylon, think about that. Hello, Mr. Babylon, come out of Babylon, touch up. Babylon's everything, right? And they were the ones who were honoring God. He took into captivity into Babylon. They were elect exiles, elect main chosen by God to be in exile of the dispersion. That's what first Peter is referencing. And um, so that he could judge the nation of Israel for their Kabbalistic worship of the gods of old. That's what he was doing. And what he what he told the Jews to put them into the Chaldeans into the Chaldeans, right. For protection. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and, and it, I think that's in the book of Daniel is talking about that Daniel and uh, even Jeremiah nine. And, and what's interesting is what God told him. So this isn't pushing back on what Doug's saying. It's just that it is hard to know how to navigate this. Like Doug's saying, like I'm tormented. Like, what do we do? Like we want the good of our nation. You know, it says when the wicked are in power, the people lament, but when the righteous rule, the people rejoice. So we should be contending for righteous things in our country, knowing the history, knowing the occultic overtones, knowing the whatever, knowing the apostasy, you know, like we should be activist for lack of a better word right now for righteousness to rule and reign in the land. Is Trump a Christian? Absolutely not. Is Trump a believer? Absolutely not. Is Trump a Kabbalist? Absolutely. He talks about it in his memoirs. Is Trump blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, like, okay, get off the man Trump and go, did he to any degree promote things that are more of a righteous thing? Yes. Versus the other guy. Okay. I. He's not... He's never going to be a uh, a pastor. He's not going to be a spiritual leader. But we want the we want jurisprudence, right? We want righteousness in life. We want lawfulness, not lawlessness. We want accountability. We want economic restraints because usury, unjust weights and measures that God hates, and He's going to destroy our economy. So we want those things. And what's interesting is when God took. Israel into Babylon, the faithful Israelites, the faithful Jews, he took in exile into Babylon. He told them, pray and seek the peace of the city where I take you for as it goes, so goes you. And he told them, plant vineyards, build houses, like go ahead and get married, like do life. He said, do life for a time. 
I put you there in exile. He said, do life for a time. And at the end of 70 years, I myself will come for you and bring you back into the land. It's actually a type and shadow of the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's all woven all the way through Genesis to Revelation. He's constantly saying the same thing. You're going to be in hostile territory. You are going to be in hostile territory. The whole world lies in the evil one. But while you're in that hostile territory, I want you to seek the good of it. I want you to be productive and industrious in it. I want you to be active in its conduct because as it goes, so goes your reality. So it is hard to go like, man, like I don't want to undergird. I don't want to support. I don't want to be part of anything with this wicked nation. It's like, I know too much now to be a part of it yet. On the flip side, it's like, but I do want to see good things rule in the land. I want to see federal law enforcement come back to a place of righteousness where they actually tear down the Kabbalistic cartel-based trafficking going on all over the face of the world, primarily in America. I want to see them come at the usury in our economic systems and all these unjust weights and measures. I want to see accountability to our wicked, lawless uh, elected officials and uh, and and uh, hold their feet to the fire. We should want those things. We should contend for those things. But at the same time, go in as Doug's saying. We need to go into them eyes wide open. You not having the Pollyanna rah rah emotionally predatory nationalistic patriotism blinding us. Go in eyes wide open to the reality of what's going on, but still have the ability to contend for the good of where we currently live. Cause as it goes, so goes our reality, you know? So it's weird. It's like this and this, this and this, I don't know how to navigate it either. You know? Well, Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon was considered to be the most powerful empire ever in existence. He was the hammer of the whole earth. He was the King of all Kings here on earth, all those titles that was given to him. But yet you had four men of God, who were underneath him, who did not bow down to him, that he lifted up above all of his other pagan advisors. And that was Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel. And then look at Joseph and Pharaoh. Yeah, I mean, same with Joseph. Uh -huh. it, it, it does not mean we as Christians cannot partake in politics. If anything, it, it would behoove us to have that. Because if not, I mean, then just put all the Satanists in charge and see how great that's going to be. And you know, um, you know what, Doug? And actually, those guys, they actually were like high level politicians and administrators and logistical masters. They were government. They, men. they actually made those nations successful and powerful. Yep. Joseph to Egypt, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel to Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon, Queen Esther, you know, through her, her influence with Artaxerxes and the nation of Persia. And you, you even see that with, uh, with, you know, even Jesus, like telling the disciples, like, Hey, don't, this is i'm not leading an insurrection like give caesar what caesar's do what name is on your coin okay like you should be working for the good of this place but remember you're an elect exile of dispersion this isn't your home you're a sojourner you're a foreigner you're an alien in a foreign land you're not of this world this world is not this world is not worthy of you you belong to a king and a kingdom but this is your mission set for a time operate within the confines of the mission set I've given you for my glory and for the good of the people around you. It, it, so it is crazy when you think about these guys actually assisted these hyper pagan occultic based principality ruling nations to be successful and God's favor was on them in it. It's a strange dichotomy. I know it, but it, but that's just, that's the world that we live in, you know? Well, and, and you had rulers always chasing after men of God. You had, um, I can't remember who the king was, who at first was sick and he was dying. And he was, he was, had sent his man to go and uh, grab Elijah, which was yeah, not uh -huh. a smart decision two times in a row. Um, and then Ahab chasing after Elijah again. And then we see the the befall of Jezebel. Um, Paul, Paul's walking around 
um, in, in Asia, and he's talking to kings. He's talking to uh, hierarchies of the Roman government. And what's he doing? He's politicking. He's talking to the Jews in the temple on the weekend. He's talking to the Jews, the Christians, the non-believers during the week. And then he he is summoned um, to Rome. He's summoned uh, to the, the governmental offices, and he's talking to the hierarchies. And he's telling them who he is. And what his testimony is. And not only to that, but his testimony was changing things. And they yeah. said, you know, hey, I'm not just a vagabond from off the street. I was Saul. I was a Pharisee's Pharisee. Pharisees were the princeling priest of Israel. And for him to say, Christ is Lord, listen to my testimony. Listen to what happened. All you guys are doing things wrong. Yet you think you're doing things right. Here, I'm going to tell you what is actually to be done. And people listen to Paul. Now others chased him from city to city to city and who chased them? The Jews, the Jews, chased the Jews. Them. Yeah. The religious spirited religion will always persecute faith. You know what, Doug, as you were saying that, I was thinking too the Roman centurion because, oops, sorry, I just bumped my mic, but there's only um, two times in scriptures where Jesus was astonished. One, the unbelief of the people in his own hometown, his own yep. family members, but the only other time he was astonished was at the faith of the centurion. And notice when the centurion made his public proclamation of the sovereignty and dominion of who Jesus was. Jesus didn't say, now stop being a soldier for Rome, who's actually going to persecute all my disciples in about mm, three years. He didn't say that. He didn't admonish him or rebuke him or cut him off from actively participating in his role in the Roman Empire as a high-level battlefield commander. He blessed him and sent him on his way. And we have no indication that the centurion stopped being an active component of the military of Rome. And guess what Rome eventually did do? Imperfectly, they actually did Christianize the rest of the world imperfectly. Listen, I know history, so don't send emails and make comments about Rome. They actually did. They did Christianize the barbarians and the Goths and the Visigoths and the Celts and the Druids on the British Isles. They did push down into North Africa and these different areas. And and you wonder, was it was it because that one interaction with the Roman centurion with Jesus and it spread? You know, and like they're like, who is this God? Like all these gods we serve are false. Anyways. What Doug and I are getting at is a lot of believers want to insulate and isolate from the world around them. They want to Pollyanna the world around them. They want to pull the wool over their own eyes. They want to ostrich themselves in the sand. By the way, do a biblical word study on ostrich. It's very particular how God describes the spirit of an ostrich. They're the dumbest, most idiotic animal ever. And that's why exactly what he says, like, you like an ostrich trample on your own young. You're so senseless, just like that giant bird. And then you bury your head in the sand when all the world's burning around you. We are actually supposed to be actively engaged, come in full circle, engage biblically with the biblical worldview around the in the world around us to be light on a hill, a bright shining light, not hidden under a basket, to be like bright shining stars in the vast expanse of the universe. It says we're to hold out the word of truth in a crooked and perverse generation. We're to rise and shine knowing that the glory of the Lord has arisen upon us, though darkness is over the earth and thick darkness is over the peoples, right? When we begin to see all these things taking place, we're supposed to stand up and and look up because a redemption draws nigh. We're supposed to do, we're supposed to work while it's still yet day because the night is coming where no man can work. We're called to be wise, not unwise, discerning the time, redeeming the time for the days are evil, making the most of every opportunity for the days are evil. We have this constant command for us to be actively engaged now more than ever. I don't care if it's Bigfoots or Bigfoots, Big Feet, Big whatever they are. UFOlogy, New Age, occultism, geopolitics, strategies, uh, activism at a local level, activism at a national level. If it's in a, your school board meetings, if it's in your reprobate apostate churches, you don't shrink back and insulate and isolate. You actually advance the kingdom of God, which is a martial language telling you, take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of the Lord, draw on the armor of God and advance the kingdom of God right through the fog of war. 
I think, Doug, that that's what you and I are trying to communicate. Well, I'll say this, that the heavens are always telling of the glory of God. And as we Christians should be sounding the alarm, time is drawing nigh. Repent, turn to Christ. The yeah. rest of the world is saying, well, we're, we're quickly coming to climate chaos, World War III. Uh, we're going to have a, uh, a meteor or asteroid impact. And we're all going to die. Or um, there's going to be the rise of AI and it's going to kill everybody. There's always something that's going to kill everyone all the time, every day. We're going to hear that. Like every 12 hours, there's a new reason to go on Amazon and, and put straight into the search engine survival dot, dot, dot. See what comes up. <laughs> but who is going to bridge the gap is going to be we Christians. We're going to bridge the gap. My wife and I are taking on a um, quite an undertaking of trying to connect black magic and the occult, black operations, and technology that we cannot explain, but we have access to. And I want to talk about that real quick. Now, you and I, I'm, we're, we're going to do a uh, an interview over some of the stuff that we both know about this type of uh Subject, but just real quick, the alien thing. Man, we hear it every freaking day, almost every day. Aliens. Now, from the History Channel, Ancient Aliens, to even some of our friends who talk about aliens, uh, who are talking about you know the the skulls and uh, the elongated skulls, all this stuff that you have half the world will not believe or even come to the sense of what. Christians are saying that they're dealing with, that they're talking to, like what the Nazis were talking to. And then you got Stephen Greer, who has a tremendous amount of backing, political backing, of money behind him, of a, a who knows, a, an army of people who are these government insiders, which I think are actually a good thing that they're telling what they're telling. However, it's how it's being spun. It's being spun to say, oh, our, our saviors are they're up there. Our saviors are going to come back, and uh, they're going to they're going to teach us how to be more spiritual. I read something from like the twenties or thirties the other day about um, this woman who was uh, a median and uh, a medium, and she she honed in on an alien on Mars, and this alien was telling her that you are to be more spiritual and you should be uh, meditating more. And by the way, Jesus is one of us and don't listen to everything on there. It's never Muhammad was one of us. It was never Buddha is one of us. It's never, uh, you know, Krishna or Shiva or, or any of these other pantheons of gods, Thor, Odin, whatever, Zeus, uh, Jupiter, it's never them. It's always Jesus. And, uh, Christianity is not what you think it is. And we're from the stars. And as you learn through Ephesians six, we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with powers, principalities, and powers of the air. And then you and notice a lot they of, masquerade, they masquerade as, as ministers of okay. righteousness. They it's a masquerade ball, right? I mean, that gets in a like from Blavatsky to Parsons to Crowley to whatever. They're always all a their shiny object. entities saying the same, saying the same thing, telling them the same thing. Hey, Jesus is one of us. Lucifer is the one true God. There's a misunderstanding in your human, your human reality. Lucifer is the Promethean entity who is coming to bring knowledge to humanity so that you guys stop hurting and destroying each other so you see how quickly the great deception is being set up for the well I, I saw something the other day that once again this is from like i think the 1800s i gotta see if i still have the article i thought it was amazing to even read this and to think like this is you know pre-19th century uh pre-post 19th century this idea was that you could you could Use sorcery and mediums, witches, and all that other stuff, necromancy, and speak to aliens. And it was a majority of Christians that were involved in this and high influences of government, high powers of the government, a bunch of ex-presidents' wives involved yes. in this. Including uh, Ronald Reagan, Reagan, including Nancy Reagan, openly talking about 
channeling medians in the old office for all the for all the uh, baby they boomers would hold and the generation that worship him. Yeah, they they held seances in the White House. They talk about it openly. Yeah. Well, and you know what? It is interesting because when you look at it, most people don't understand that the rise of hyper occultism in the United, well, I'm just speaking Western citrically, United States of America, the rise of hyper occultism began in the early to mid 1800s. And what did you get as soon as that broke out? The industrial revolution and the entire face of the earth has changed in a matter of 100 years and went from that to the production of rockets, space programs, and nuclear weapons deployment and computers yeah, in we, 100 years. And it was right in the mid-1800s in the United States, not Nazi Germany, not the, 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 the czars of Russia, not down into the Far East and their all their dragon worship stuff that was going on in the Far East, which most people have no clue of Eastern uh, history here in the West. It wasn't in the... Uh, European nations, which are the most sick of fan, especially those Alpine religions and stuff like that, of occultism, it all was birthed out of the United States of America in the mid 1800s. And that's where theosophy through Madame Blavatsky and then what would be Alice Bailey. And then she went and taught the czars, which became communism. She went and taught uh, the Germans, which became Nazism. And she taught in the US, they would hold uh, retreats in Washington, D.C., and I can't remember, like Northern California and stuff, and all the elites of America would come learn under Blavatsky, and you had this explosion in technology, explosion in paranormal activity, explosion in space-based programs and and high-level weapon systems that we can't even understand, explosion in high-level occultism, sexual perversion, uh, mind-altering pharmacia, all at the exact same time on the face of the earth, mid-1800s. And that brings us to today, you know? I don't understand how we went from, like, 1775 muskets, right, to 1800s, um, the the steam industrial complexes that were first being used. The Mormons, actually, I think were one of the first ones to revolutionize steam factories uh, for for milling grain. Um, And then from there, we have uh, the great expansion of America. Uh, the mid to 1800s with the railroad and we know all the wars that come from that and from there i mean like you said within a hundred years we're now what well, we got satellites that can look into other galaxies and so there's there's a connection here everywhere we have this explosion of technology around these people we have an even greater explosion in occultism Yep, always and, they go hand in hand. Yeah, and uh, you know, Madame Blavatsky and Theosophy, and then her teachings with uh, the Germans. They got Ariosophy from that, which is where they think Aryan and Aryan race is like you know, that's that's the greatest, latest of everything. Um, yeah, which became Thelema and through the Vril Maidens and the Thelema yeah. and the Thule Society and all that. Yeah, and yeah. then and then you get Aleister Crowley, a former a British intelligence agent that's not very well known, a a simple street magician, as he's also called, uh, who is a sycophant. And then you've got Jack Parsons, the Babylon working, the sex magic. And then we've got nuclear missiles, um, rockets, all this stuff is just a a little plug on the, uh, Babylon working ceremony, which they braggadociously published that they were successful in, and the female hybridized entity that was born nine months after the conduct identified itself as Hilarion or Hillary. And it just so fact, so, so happens to share from Jack Parsons and Alistair Crowley, the exact same birthday as one Hillary Clinton, which with the soon arriving removal of Joe Biden, everybody sees the stages being set. It's either going to be uh, Big Mike Obama, who's going to be put in place, or I just heard the rumblings today that Hillary Hilarion is making her move to rise into that position once again. I so think it's new. Either get Big Mike or you get Hilarion. 
Take I your think pick. it's I think it's Newsom. You think so? I think it's Newsom because of his connection with uh with China. I, I mean he's yeah, he's a, he is he's a sold slick, out. He, he's a slick dude. Um, I see him as a VP under one of those women. And again, remember yeah, the I matriarchal aspect that I was talking about earlier and the transgenderism aspect that we were talking about earlier is high level occultism, high level occultism. So it, I don't know, man, it's like this thing is reaching a great crescendo. So, yeah, it, I know we really can talk is. for hours, bro. We'll have to do like uh, some more shows on this for sure. And well, let's like hone in let's on sum this up. Yeah, let's let's sum this up for the people. <laughs> uh, real quick words. Um, the whole world lies in the evil one. Turn to Christ. There you go. Prepare for what's coming. I mean, that's the easiest way to do it. But uh, Jamie, let me ask you uh, with with what's happened lately politically, and you know, there's been also a lot of uh, a lot of these mega church uh pastors ministers who are being exposed to be involved in stuff like the stuff that sean combs p diddy uh the epstein island uh the yeah. horrific stuff with kids um what do you see coming for the rest of this year because my my mind is still on hearing the drum beats of war i think that's what's going to happen but it's anybody's ball game really so what do you think? What what are you seeing? Yeah, war. I, same to? thing. I'm in agreement with you. War. War is at the centrality of everything that, for one, the Lord has, uh, you know, touched my spirit to, to have an understanding of or discernment of, but also just the didactic compartmentalization of the objective empirical data that's out there is war is uh, war is the big show. I believe that it'll be uh, one of the trigger events or the loosing potentially of the red horse as listed in the book of Revelation where peace is taken from the earth and men are given over to slaughter one another. I think uh, the incrementalism of the logistical aspects of this new age of hybrid asymmetric warfare are already done and over with, whether you're looking at signals intelligence to humans intelligence to cybernetics to whatever, you know, uh, logistical supply chain warfare, economic warfare through all the sanctions and all that, all that stuff is done. The prepositioning of assets all over the globe is done. And uh, when the day comes, it's going to be an all skate. Uh, nations that people don't even think about are going to move on one another. And in order to do that, the U.S. has to be hit first. And that was what the debate last night to me was a giant signal by the Luciferian elite, even with the fact that they published their numbers that 33 percent. Imagine that 33 percent of Americans believe that Joe Biden handily won the debate. Of course, they're putting out their number there to signal to all the enemies it's go time. Let's do this thing. And uh, I I personally believe that the U.S. is going to be significantly hit uh, cybernetically through some kind of uh, Internet based takedown of critical infrastructure, uh, which will trickle into economics. And it's going to create increased internal civil strife. And then we're going to see a significant global conflagration of multiple theaters of radical warfare all break open at the same time and eventually it will lead into a kinetic attack from foreign superpowers on the u.s mainland i anticipate seeing that in the next 18 months maximum but potentially before the election or just after election before a new all the appointees and everything everybody gets settled in into their new roles so i could see it even being like a spring offensive come next year i think we're still gonna have civil war a civil strife of some kind um but you and i we've talked about this so much i think we're pretty much in agreement with each other if anything we we complete each other's sentences it any man with we're our so cute type together. of knowledge, <laughs> any <laughs> any man with our with our types of experience and knowledge of how government works, the military <laughs> and politics, you can see this coming a million miles, a away. million miles away. Yeah, million miles away. 
So. And, and I, it's not armchair quarterbacking stuff. And it's not like, you know, I mean, you, you guys that are listening to us, you guys know that Doug and I are scrubs among scrubs, right? We're just bros that do what we do, but it actually, when it, the, the older I get, I realize that it works to our benefit to have been boots on the ground guys, not the big high level strategizing guys, the big high level pontificating things where it's all, it's all uh, cerebral, right? Like at a general staff level, but to have been at a sergeant level boots on the ground, both in uh, the military and law enforcement and operating down in the muck and the mire, we kind of have different eyes to see how these, the logistics come into place how their main manifests, how you administrate the tactics, techniques, and procedures, the employment and deployment of these assets on a ground level, kind of at that ground level, we have a little bit of different eyes to understand when we see these things at the higher, the higher level strategy level, we know how they're implemented on the ground and it gives us the right lenses with which to be able to start making adequate analysis about what's coming next. Interesting times. Very, very much very, so. Very, very interesting times. Train, prepare, and pray. Jamie, um, lead us out in prayer, brother. Yeah, bro. Absolutely. Let's pray. Lord, we uh we do thank you and praise you that you give us time still to uh to seek your face while it may be found. And that you give us space for grace for the reviving of our eyes and a refreshing of our souls, as it says in Ezra 9, Lord. I praise you, God, that you're giving space for each individual who may ever even come across this conversation to repent, uh, to consecrate their camps, like in the days of Achan and Joshua, to uh, remove any of the devoted things that they've hidden in their tents so that they're not made liable for destruction on the field of battle, God. So I thank you for your grace. I thank you that we have the ability to still use the internet, God, and to to uh, communicate across the airwaves or for Doug and I to communicate, even though we live very far apart from each other. Lord, I thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness. And I praise you, God, that we belong to a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And that though the kings of the earth set themselves against your anointed one and they deride him and they break his bonds asunder, that it's you, O oh God, who just laughs and scoffs at all their attempts to overthrow your glory and your kingdom. And then you terrify them in your wrath by declaring that you've installed your son on Zion, your holy hill, your son, Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord, that his name is even on my lips. I know Doug does as well, too. There's no reason why reprobates like us should have your name on our lips. So we thank you, God, for redeeming us from the pits of hell, God, and from our own carnality and giving us a new life in your son, Jesus Christ. And I pray that anybody who's on the fence, that they would understand that they can entrust their whole lives to you and you're not going to disappoint god i pray that they would just confess and repent right now and they would cry out for a savior and jesus christ and i know that you are faithful and just lord to hear them and answer them and cleanse them from all unrighteousness and give them a good mission set for the days ahead thank you god and we pray all these things in the powerful life-giving name of jesus our soon coming conquering king amen Amen. Maranatha. Well, may the peace and grace of our Lord Jesus be with you all. Um, pay attention to the news. It could get dicey any freaking day. Stay prepared. Yeah, stay prayed up. And we'll see you next time. Thank you all for watching and for supporting us. See you again. Stay